Hi, my name is Brianna Ashworth. I'm a senior at the University of North Dakota, and this is my second year out here on the prairies doing this project with Ducks Unlimited. So we are searching for duck nests on multiple plots in the prairie pothole region, and we find duck nests from a ton of different nest or ground breeding birds, such as gadwall, mallards, blueing teal. We found a widgeon, lesser scop. The list goes on. We also find a lot of shorebirds. Um, a lot of undergrads have the opportunity to make their own individual project based off of this and for example I'm doing a project on gadwall nesting ecology. This project started um, about eight years ago in 2015 uh, when I sat down with the DU, the Ducks Unlimited Great Plains um, staff and particularly Kaylin Kimmick and Tanner Gu at the time and we wanted to create something that not only helped advance the science but at the same time was training the next generation of um, waterfowl and wetland scientists. And so this project came out of that idea of sort of a dual purpose of training the next generation at the same time as collecting valuable information about um, nesting densities. Um, we do different kinds of projects out here with techniques such as like nest cameras. Um, we've used unmanned aircraft or drones. And so we've used this as a training grounds for the newer technology as well um, that also advances science but trains that next generation of, of students. And so it's predominantly been driven by undergraduates um, getting their first field experiences. So the plan for the day is right now they're um, packing up camera boxes to put on the back of the ATVs. Um, we just filled up the ATVs and he's brushing the batteries so we get a better connection so the uh, cameras stay connected longer. Plan is today Gavin and I are going to uh, Davis Ranch to uh, drag plot. What plot are we dragging over there? Plot 10. Plot 10. And, um, Avery and Bree are staying on Coteau today to drag plot five. So that's the Florida plot and that's a pretty nice plot and it's got a lot of nests on it so you guys should have a lot of fun on that one. We're about to approach this nest. Um, and see if the hen is there and check the nest. Um, we want to see if she's still incubating and how everything's progressing um, or if, if she's been eaten by or the nest has been eaten by a predator. So we got two UND students that are dragging and looking for nests and at the same time they check the nest. So Gavin's approaching, we get close. If she's there, she should flush. And the nest should be right up in front of us. It hasn't flushed yet, so there she goes. Oh, she must be getting close to duckling a little bit. All right, we'll come in here real slowly. We don't want to step on the eggs. We don't want to mat the nest down. As you can see it, she's covered up. So we have a blue winged teal right here. All right, Gavin, tell us about, so this is Gavin Caruso. He's a UND student. Um, tell us about what you're, what you're gonna do right now. Um, so we have an app on our phone that we take all the data on. Um, we're gonna, one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna count the amount of eggs that are in the nest. So there's uh, four, eight, there's 10 eggs. So Brianna is right now using the app to record what Gavin is telling you. So that's Brianna Ashworth, also another UND student. And the next thing we're gonna do is gently candle the eggs. So you put, put them like this and you look through the one end to determine how far along in incubation the eggs are. And why would we care about that, Gavin? Um, it, we can only camera eggs after a certain day of incubation. And so we're looking for uh, five to six day incubation to start cameraing. Yep, and then we also want to know when she's going to hatch. So you typically check two, three, maybe four eggs, mm -hmm. depending upon what you're seeing. 
and you're looking for what what in there when you're looking at it? Um, the darkness of the egg. Mm -hmm. um, if the darkness on both sides of the egg are coming together to meet in the middle of the egg and um, pretty much the clarity of the egg because the less clear it is the farther along it's going to be. So the duckling's filling up the egg now, right? Yep. It's getting bigger and it's taking it up and it's going to block more of the light. I'm going to say eight on incubation. Okay. So eight as in days of incubation into it? Yep. Okay. And how long do they typically incubate? Do you guys know that? Uh, about what, 21, 21 days for a teal. Yep. So yeah, I'd say eight. Okay, so she's about a third of the way through. Yep. Okay, what else do we do? That's basically it, unless we want to put a camera out. Do you have a camera with you? Yeah. yeah. We have let's, another one we can put out. Let's go ahead and put a camera on her. Okay, All sure. Right. So we're going to put a nest camera on her, and that way we can um, determine if a, a predator comes in. We can c confirm who the predator is. Um, in addition to that, we can look at how she comes and goes from the nest. So birds do um, nest attendance, which is the time that they spend taking care of the nest. So that's heating the nest, keeping it warm, doing nest maintenance, like turning the eggs. But she's there protecting the nest from thermal stressors, from predators, and actively heating and incubating it to keep it warm for development. What's interesting is determining um, when they leave, what time of the day. So for us to nest drag, we need birds on the nest. So if we're dragging at times when the hens aren't there, it makes it hard to locate the nest. Um, in addition to that, we can tell an awful lot about the bird um, and what's happening with her stress-wise. So if a bird comes to uh, prairies and she gets off the nest all the time, she's probably not in great body condition. I mean, she's got to go forage. She's trying to get her, her own reserves up to be able to actually maintain the nest. On average, typical um, duck nests like a blue-winged teal or a mallard, they're going to leave the nest about twice a day. Um, and depending on the species, the, typically those are early, early in the morning, right at, uh, at dawn, and again, later afternoon. Um, and kind of early evening and they're leaving for 45 minutes sometimes an hour at a time um, when they depart so that's at least what we found um, in the past eight years as we've looked at mallards blue wing teal and gadwall as our primary focus okay right now they're getting ready to set up a nest camera um, they have to run a cable we're not using any wireless ones these are little older cameras um, wireless technology works if you have some decent networks and things like that but it's hard out here where we have hit and miss um, internet type capabilities so um, we just record to a, a DVD um, or a DVR I'm sorry with a little SD card and we'll show you that piece in a minute so he's gonna put a miniature surveillance camera it's like if you go to a gas station and you look up in the corner of the surveillance camera that's exactly what we're using here um, is that kind of surveillance camera the idea is um, not setting the camera in the face of the Sun so you'll be able to watch the footage very well and the camera is close enough to the nest where you can determine whether the hen uh, is on the nest or off the nest. Um, that'll help us do checks later on and determining if she's there so we don't flush her. It um, is a less stress on the hen, but making sure it's close enough that we can see it and properly record data later on. So the camera uses um, some LEDs for night. Um, those LEDs are at about 950 nanometers, and the idea is that that should be just outside sort of the visible spectrum. Um, so hopefully it's not like this big glowing light. Um, that being said, we do know that some animals can see into more of that infrared spectrum. Um, so it's probably not absolutely perfect, but, you know, we have no indications that suggest that it's impacting the overall survival. Um, and survival can work. Some of the stuff that's been done on nest cameras can go both ways and that sometimes critters are curious. So if you have raccoons around, they tend to be curious predators and they'll come in to see novel things. Um, whereas things like fox tend to be wary. They don't like smells, they don't like new anything. So they tend to keep more of a wider berth. So in some ways there's aspects that, you know, having these out here could work in both different ways that way. But a lot of the research shows it doesn't really impact the actual um, survival. Okay. Is that keeping it? Yeah, that yeah. feels better. Okay, Bree, can you double check us one more time? Just a 
So we pulled just a little bit out of the camera view so we can see her. It's gonna grow some back, but we wanna make sure stuff overhead's good. We're gonna cover the eggs back up so they're covered underneath her down. Kind of push her back in there. Okay. And then we try to make sure we don't also trip on this as we go. All right, here's. So we'll follow the cable back up here. And we'll show you what's actually happening. So this is set in a way that um, we can actually come back and change the batteries and not flush the hen at all. Um, change the SD cards. So you'll see right here, um, this is where the recording happens. Bree, you want to tell us um, yeah. what all is in here and what you're doing? Yeah, so this is the camera box. So this has like all the wiring and stuff that'll allow us to like see the image that's on the mini surveillance camera down there. Um, this is called a tote vision. So this is what we can plug into the box to see the actual nest. And then these have to be hooked up to these batteries and the charge on these only lasts about like four days and the SD cards fill up at about four days so we have to change these pretty regularly. Um, let's see. But the perk of that is we can come back and because the box is so far from the, the nest, um, ultimately we can change the batteries, change the SD card and the hen can stay there and not be disrupted at all. And you can do actually kind of another nest check by looking because you can plug in the the tote vision or a little LCD screen and say, oh, she's there, everything looks good. Or you can go, oh no, she's not sitting there and go back to the nest and actually say, okay, did something happen? Is she just off for recess or um, was the, the nest, did a predator eat it? So they're gonna drive around this so they don't run over anything that they just set up. And then they're gonna continue on their way and keep dragging. So what you're seeing right now is this chain and you can see it going across the grassland and as it goes across the grassland it's going over the grass and what happens the the birds are nested down in um, kind of under that grass and so the chain will go over and as it approaches the hen she flushes off and you'll notice it and that's when you go okay there's a nest right there and so they go and they back and forth across the prairie just like if you were mowing your lawn back this way down and they follow their tracks trying to kind of keep it so that it's um, overlapping and, and just like you would in your lawn not missing areas that's it being said if there's spots like really wet areas where we can't drive through we don't go through those um, really rocky or high cliff edges we don't drag over that for safety reasons um, but as you go across the, the main parts of the prairie you can just go up and back up and back up and back um, and we do that on about an every other week basis so we're not overly pressuring the the um, grasslands and making too much of a uh, marks on the landscape as well. The nest is very neatly. Yeah. Oh, come check this out. Right. So there's holes in them. So you can see there's actually quite a bit of cover here. Oh yeah. Some they still have yolk in them. So it ate them out of the sides of the yep. eggs. And... One thing we've determined um, from some of our work is we paired assessments on the ground and saying, okay, where's the hole in the egg? Uh, what's, how big like damage? How much is it scattered about? Are there dug areas? And we've looked at all these different characteristics that historically have been thought to lead you to a conclusion of who the predator is. And in fact, that doesn't work terribly well. Our cameras will tell us a different different species. We're really good at saying the nest either succeeded and hatched because there's membranes present or it failed, which you can see here, um, kind of a classic fail, but determining who the predator is is almost impossible without a camera. So the most common predators out here um, are badgers, skunks. We have occasional raccoons. So our most common ones are badgers by far. More than, gosh, 70% of our nests over the last eight years have been badgers. Um, and then as Gavin rightly pointed out, um, skunks and raccoons are common. Occasionally you'll have a ground squirrel take a nest or an egg or two, but they don't usually destroy the whole clutch. Um, and then um, coyote occasionally, but again, only a, we've only had a couple coyotes in eight years ever destroy a nest. Um, we've had very few fox. I mean, I think there was one or two as well. Um, and then we've had white-tailed deer take a couple. And so that's an unusual predator, but you know, it's a power-packed, 
bit of protein right there. Um, so they won't they won't miss a chance at that. And I actually saw that as well on Bob White quail and other species that they've they've eaten eggs and they've eaten fish sometimes off people's stringers and so yeah. But the badgers are far and away our number one predator for nests here. And that rock pile over there, things can live in that. Oh yeah. So I'm not surprised. <laughs> when I see a rock pile like that and we got a wetland right next to it, those are ideal places for um, mammalian predators. Okay, so we've got back um, to the office from dragging all day and we've collected all of our data from our SD cards. For my project, I'm trying to find out what the recess time for a blue-winged teal is and that's the time for when she leaves the nest and how long it takes for her to come back to the nest. And I'm doing this project to compare to Bree's project to see how long gadwall have been off nests and how long they are on nest and seeing if that it either helps or hurts them if the nest is successful to see maybe if they're off longer a predator comes or if they're on the nest longer it doesn't come. So on this video right here we have a blue winged teal hen uh, coming back to her nest from a recess. So she pops her head in and then eventually she'll come all the way onto the nest. And then once she is settled on the nest we go over to our excel sheet and uh, we uh, enter in information. So unfortunately, we don't really have like an average time from all, all the data we've gathered from Blue Wing Teal to see how long the recess time average is because we are still in the process of collecting all the data. So the project isn't done yet. So we just have to wait a while until we get more information and then we can crunch all the numbers together. So I have some data that we collected by chain dragging and camming nests from 2021. And um, this is kind of about my project. I'm focusing on Gadwall and their nesting ecology. So I'm looking at like how long they take recesses. I'm also looking at what time they take those recesses and also how that relates to if their nest is successful or not. So here I have a couple graphs. This, this one kind of just shows like how often they take their recesses. Um, the red lines here represent sun, sunrise and sunset. So you can kind of see that there's some peaks and recesses after sunrise and right before sunset um, and then here's my success fail analysis so this is um, basically relating the time that they were gone to whether or not their nest was successful and um, this plot doesn't really give you a very good idea they don't look very different um, I only cammed 12 nests last summer so I'm planning on adding data from 2019 up until the summer of 2022 to hopefully make some more clear patterns in my data. So I'm Gavin Herbert. I'm a crew lead this year for um, the Ducks crew. Um, so this year I'm going to be looking at predation times of day and species um, differences. So basically I'm going to be looking at what time of day um, predators are hitting the nest and if it's different between species so if badgers are hitting nests different times than skunks are hitting the nests or raccoons so this would be a prime example of a raccoon predating a nest so basically what we'll do after this point is record the time which is over in the corner and the date in an excel file and so for this for this project it's still really too early to tell on any of this stuff and we will basically be taking all these points at the end of the summer and all of our predation events and putting them all together to see what the conclusions are. Well, thank you guys for following us along in the prairie pothole region here. If you like the content in this video, go ahead and subscribe and like this video. If you guys would like to keep watching us through the summer, follow at Real DuckTales on Instagram and Facebook.